Good afternoon and welcome to the People's Pensions Advisor webinar. We're here to answer your questions about the People's Pension and keep those questions coming please because we'll be taking as many as possible over the next 45 minutes. For any members watching, there will be a special webinar for members on the 28th of February. Please do sign up online. But with no further ado, let me introduce our panel. Joining myself, Greg McClymont, Director of Policy and External Affairs at the People's Pension today are Roy Porter, Group Director of Sales and Marketing, Steve Dillo, Chairman of the Board of Trustees, and David Madison, Trustee Director at the People's Pension. Gentlemen, thank you for joining me. Today we'll be covering highlights from the last year uh, of the People's Pension, a quick update on Brexit, the subject which never seems to be resolved, and most importantly, answering your questions. So as I said a moment ago, please keep those questions coming. So without further ado, let's go into the discussion. Steve, it's been another busy year for the People's Pension. Membership has grown significantly. Assets have grown substantially. New trustees have joined the trustee board. Uh, can you just bring our audience up to date on what's happened in the last year? Certainly, yep. Definitely been a very busy year. Getting busier with Master Trust authorization at the moment. Probably more about that later. Uh, but the scheme has grown substantially over the last year, so we're now sitting with some 4.1 million members of the scheme, uh, assets of around about 5 billion, a little bit more, and 80,000 or more participating employers at today's date. So it is a massive enterprise, lots and lots of moving parts, and clearly the governance of this is of paramount importance. Uh, therefore, I'm delighted to uh, announce the changes that occurred this year to the trustee board. Um, firstly, Chris Fagan, well known within the investment consulting community, uh, joined the trustee board. He's going to have a particular focus uh, on investment matters and has joined the investment committee. And David Madison joined the board at the same time. David uh, has a fantastic reputation in the industry for knowing the operational side inside out and has had a lot of uh, senior leadership roles. So having his gravitas on the board has really helped matters going forwards. Uh, and two long-standing stalwarts of the board remain, Alan Pickering, very well known in the industry, uh, and Sue Lewis, both sit on the board bringing their particular skills and uh, laser-targeted view of doing things right to to the day-to-day -day governance. So I think we're in very good shape but lots to do. Thanks, Steve. That sounds like you know, a lot has been happening in the members' interests. Can I just bring you to that point about the, the interests of members of the scheme? Uh, could you say a little about how the, the independent board of trustees operates in relationship to the day-to-day -day running of the people's pension, where authority lies, who make the decisions and where the buck stops? Sure. Well, the buck stops in one place. That's with the trustee board. And it's my privilege to lead that board. So ultimately, it's this five-person team that is sitting there driving forward the day-to-day -day, uh, governance. Um, we meet formally as a trustee board at least quarterly. Um, substantial full-day meetings where senior people from the people's pensions business come in to present <coughs> on everything from investments to operation. And that includes uh, Patrick Heathlay, the chief executive, who will update on the on the strategy of the business and where things are going commercially. So those meetings are the linchpin of the governance. We then have two key committees that sit beneath it. The Investment Committee, chaired by Alan Pickering. Uh, I sit on that, along with Chris Fagan. And the Risk Administration and Communications Committee, chaired by David. I'm sure he'll say some more later. Uh, he and Sue are the key members of that, and their job is to keep on top of all of the operational and comms aspects. So those are the key bodies that we use to drive things forward, but there's a lot of activity that goes on between meetings. Um, it's rarely a week goes by that I'm not in the People's Pension Office getting involved with something, and all of the trustee directors are getting involved offline to a, to a fairly great extent. So that's how the governance is driven. We see our job as being the one where we're the main fiduciary responsibility for making sure that members' interests are absolutely looked after and that the scheme develop, develops uh, and adapts and evolves indeed as the scale grows. And it's getting bigger and bigger. Thank you, Stephen. It is indeed over <coughs> five billion in assets now and, and growing um, significantly. Roy, can I just bring you in at this, this point? With a very strong sense of the way in which the, the independent board of trustees operates under fiduciary law um, in the interests of members of the scheme. But your team on a day-to-day -day basis are, are working with advisors. Can you give me a sense 
um, for our advisor audience of what you feel our priorities as a business are and how they're aligned with the advisor community? Yeah, um, so, so nothing's really changed, Greg. Um, the fact is that having been an advisor, it, sound, it f feels like thousands of years ago, but um, once I was an advisor and what I was looking for from pension providers, insurers and so on and so forth hasn't changed. So what I want from them is uh, them to help me, to help my customers. Um, it's as simple as that, really. It's always been like that. Um, it's about getting the basics right, making sure that if advisors have got a question uh, or they want to contact us, it's, it's easy for them to do so. So um, I think unlike uh, a number of uh, schemes out there, you, know, you can very easily get through to a member of our staff, whether you've got representation in the field uh, or whether you're, you're phoning through to, um, to one of our customer services groups. Um, you will be able to speak to us very, very easily. Uh, and we, we aim uh, to provide answers as quickly as we possibly can, uh, taking a, a really simple and straightforward approach to things. So, so nothing's really changed there. Um, and I'm pleased to say that uh, you know, our standards uh, have been maintained, even though the scheme has grown exponentially over the last 12 months. Thank you, Roy. We're going in more detail into some of those issues. Before we do, we can't go any further without <coughs> having an update on Brexit. Steve, just quickly, um, what can we do given the uncertainty, uh, the, the lack of clarity on, on what the final deal or no deal is going to be um, to prepare for, for Brexit and those eventualities? Okay, I was worried you were going to ask me what the answer was there <laughs> for a second, Greg. I don't know that. I don't think that's the problem, isn't it? We're, it's an unprecedented situation. We haven't seen the like of this before. All sorts of outcomes could play out, be it no deal, the current Theresa May deal, be it another referendum, who knows? But we're in a situation where I sit through many trustee meetings with lots of different advisors. There's no real consensus on what could happen in each of those scenarios in terms of the markets, the value of sterling and interest rates. So given all of that uncertainty, what can one do? Realistically, it's stick to one's knitting and do the things that are always important in investment with pension funds, which is to make sure you're well diversified, that you're internationally spread, that you're meeting regularly to keep on top of things, that you're getting good management information, and if something requires immediate attention, you're able to convene the decision maker swiftly. All of that is in place with the people's pension. We're very well diversified, more diversified over the last year, so I believe that we can be reassured that whatever the Brexit outcome, you know, there's going to be some froth that's going to occur in some direction. We should be well placed to, to mitigate some of that. Thank you, Stephen. That's diversification by geography and, and by asset class. Geography, asset class, um, the key things here. And we're further diversified and have been more over the year and will do more. OK, hopefully the politicians can sort things out some stage. <laughs> uh, live questions come in. Uh, Roy, I'm going to put this one to you and, and to the panel more widely. Uh, when are the People's Pension going to apply for authorisation for your Master Trust? Oh, good question, yeah. Um, so, um, I think, uh, let's go back to basics on this. So, first of all, um, and I understand that most of the advisors out there will understand this, but let's think about, first of all, why authorisation is coming in. So, authorisation is coming in because pretty much anybody uh, could have set up a Master Trust. Um, and clearly, the new authorisation process is all about ensuring that members get that much needed security. So um, the, the regulator's looking for increased sort of systems and processes. They're looking at uh, robust uh, continuity strategy, um, financial support, and that financial sustainability. And we're in a really good place to, uh, uh, to support given our scale and the sort of governance approach that we take. Um, now, having said that, we've been working for the past ooh, six months, I guess, uh, on taking a pragmatic approach to um, our submission, authorisation submission. Uh, we've taken legal advice, we've taken auditing advice, we've taken covenant advice, we've taken a lot of advice. Um, and we're in a position now that we will make our uh, submission to the regulator uh, within the next couple of weeks. It's going it, to, th this um, authorization process incidentally is done online. We reckon it's going to take us about a week to actually just upload all the information. It's that, you know, there's that much to do. Very, very worthwhile process, um, but a really significant amount of information needing to be gleaned. Uh, and as I say, we wanted to do this uh, properly. Um, and 
we believe that we're in a position now to submit. So, so yeah, it's, it's an imminent submission. And the master trust authorisation is a very big moment, isn't it? I mean, it reflects, I think, today the 10 million barrier um, has been broken through in terms of auto-enrolment scheme membership. And as you say, Roy, we had a position in really in, until master trust authorisation process is complete, where really anyone could set up a, a master trust. And now the assets are, are getting more and more significant, tens of billions, and it's going to you know move quickly beyond that into hundreds of billions, 10 million people. This is really about, the process is about ensuring that master trusts are fit for you know, for the, for this, what has become a very big part of the pensions landscape, isn't it? Yeah. And I got the sense that uh, size and strength, in your view, matters is the largest independent master trust in the UK. Uh, size and strength allows you to have that that security in terms of protecting members' monies. Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, um, I know that a lot of the advisory firms that that we speak to are very keen to understand, you know, who's going in for authorisation, who's exiting the market. Uh, and quite and quite rightly so, because they need to know for, for for their members and for their um, uh, for their customers. But we have a slight problem, really, in that the, the pensions regulator has said that there's about 90 master trusts. I think eight have publicly said that they've uh, submitted. Seven have publicly exited the market. We took one of those cases on. In fact, I think um, the YWP case that we took on um, has is still the, the largest one that's taken place so far. Um, I understand that there's about 30 or so that are expecting to exit the market. Uh, we've had conversations with lots of them. Um, I can, I think we need to be clear that uh, we will only take on business that's in the best interests of our members. So we go through a lot of due diligence and scrutiny as to whether we want to take any of this business on or not. Um, we can't really say who they are because of non-disclosure agreements and commercial sensibilities, and also the members of those schemes need to be complete, uh, uh, communicated at the right time by, the, by those trustees. So um, it's a little bit of an unknown at the moment. I think the other thing for advisors to be aware of uh, is that at the moment, we're talking about merger and acquisition activity really more than pension scheme switches. Um, so a lot of the, the movement in the market is not purely about one scheme moving to the other. It's about uh, looking at the, the distribution in the future. It's looking about uh, looking at um, maybe taking a seat on the board of that trustee or trying to keep some skin in the game for the founder. Um, so we're not really looking for that, that, that sort of business. Having said that, when we get into the authorization process itself, if there are any failures, um, then we're ideally placed to help and support those organisations. Um, and then when we come out the other side, my personal view is that the market will continue to consolidate. Um, but again, we're then back into a, an M&A position, uh, which, is, it, which is quite unusual. So there's a lot going on. Mm. There is governance, as always, the single most important thing, a well-run scheme, which we've uh, covered so far. There is Brexit, mm. uh, which is what it is at this stage and there is master trust authorisation. I want to take us on now into other thing absolutely critical to, to pension scheme arrangements. Some people would say the most important thing. Contributions. David, turning to, to you, we know from April 2019 there's going to be a change to contribution levels, this, the, you know, the, the statutory contributions under auto enrolment, the minimum contributions. Can you just clarify for, for the watching audience what, ha what is happening in April 2019 and what the, the background is to this. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thanks, Greg. I'm, I probably don't need to tell these guys. I, I'm, I'm sure they're well aware. But from 6th of April, we've, we've got the third phase in contribution where the total minimum contribution goes up to 8%, split five member, three employer. So it's going up 1% for employers and 2% for members. I, I guess the background was the government wanted to encourage more people to save. They wanted to do it in phases to avoid a cliff edge where where uh, highly unlikely people would want to pay uh, a significant amount into their pension. Um, and the idea was that this would sort of help employers and their advisors and ease the admin burden over time. Now, sound, sounds big headline, another 3% three, three but the main thing to realise is 1% for employers, 2% for members. And your sense of the 
from a point of view of the people's pension. So that, this is, you know, as you've said very clearly, David, that, you know, the third mm -hmm. and a clearly set out process and um, by legislation of those of those um, three staging contribution point of view. Mm -hmm. uh, from an employer's point of view, and maybe Roy, you're the, the right person to take this part of the question. Um, are employers going to see any change? Employers that use the people's pension, specifically advisors, mm -hmm. from the advisor point of view of advising employers, any changes in the way in which we approach this this rise in contributions? Uh, so not really. Um, I mean, a lot of advisors that have, uh, have put um, uh, their customers our way will be familiar with the uh, the way that we dealt with um, uh, contribution increases last year. Um, not much has changed there insofar as uh, we're taking the pain out of it for a uh, for, for employers in that if they're operating to statutory minimums, um, so they're operating within the, um, uh, the statutory bands for contribution purposes, then uh, we will make the change on behalf of those employers and make sure that they meet the minimum requirements. So in April we'll just do, it, do that for them, they won't need to do anything. If, um, if employers are paying more than the statutory minimums, and a lot of advisory business is more than the statutory minimums, they'll still need to check to make sure that even if they are paying you know, first pound up, if you like, or nine, ten percent, that um, the amount that they're paying still meets with those statutory minimums. Thank you, Roy. And more broadly, <coughs> uh, David, and for the panel yeah. uh, generally, the, the last set of contribution increases to five percent went off with very, very small uh, increases in opt-out rates, if any increases at all. Do you have a view on what's likely to happen in April onwards? Do we think, and this is just more broadly, sense that, that we could see more significant opt-outs? Well, well, last time around we, we all worried about it, and I think the data from the PLSA was that uh, there was only a 0.2% increase in the, the months uh, after the increase, and uh, whether it was inertia or not, I think the industry, we were quite pleased that people were continuing to save. Again, hard, hard to say really, I guess. One of the messages we were trying to get across today is, there's a massive amount of information online for um, advisors and their, and their employers, their clients that, that um, will help explain the changes. Um, we've got online toolkits, we've got posters they can have. We've, we've got a great online video for members, which is, I think is two or three minutes, but you know, I'd recommend it for anyone. It's re really worth a watch. And I think we're, one of the reasons I joined <coughs> the People's Pension really was because um, I, I love the approach of being uh, straightforward, you know. So, uh, which and, and trying to do the best they can to support employers and uh, and their advisors and we've got sort of prompts all along the way and uh, I guess um, if advisors on, on this call feel there's anything we can improve we'd be delighted to but I've been thoroughly impressed with with the access to clear information and you know I, I wish would be that that we have the same experience as we had in uh, 2018. And hopefully the, the rise to 8% of qualifying earnings goes off smoothly because, yeah. of course, 8% contributions um, on qualifying earnings, admittedly, is potentially taking people closer to having a, a reasonable sum at retirement that they yeah. can turn into a retirement income alongside their state pension and other savings. Yeah. Well, it's looking a bit more serious now, isn't it? At 8%, mm -hmm. that members can still save more, may well be well served to do so, but it's now a meaningful figure I think inertia is now starting to work in favour of all of this policy uh, and I think there's a lot more member confidence generally uh, in auto-enrolment pensions than when we set out. So I think it's all a good basis for the future. <coughs> I also think that um, you know, when you're looking at the, the member increase, to a certain extent that's going to be offset by the increase in personal allowance. So I wouldn't expect there to be huge opt-outs because I think many, many people won't recognise a big increase. <coughs> Thank you, right. It's a very good point. So we've covered some of the big issues so far, the, the latest contributions. I think one that we haven't covered yet, which is absolutely critical, of course, to the investment of pension contributions. How does how does a pension scheme go around about ensuring that the contributions get a good return over the long term? Steve, as chairman of the board, very important issue. I'm going to ask you about the people's pensions investment approach. Any changes were made in the last 12 months, performance in the last 12 months, and looking forward, um, how we are seeking to ensure those, those good returns, but on as stable a basis as possible over the long term? Sure. Well, all of this is controlled by the Investment Committee. Most of the responsibility is delegated by the trustee board down to that. So Alan Pickering, 
as I mentioned earlier, very well known in the industry. Uh, one of the widest, wisest men out there is responsible for chairing that. Chris Fagan and I sit on that. And we work closely with the uh, in-house <coughs> team, uh, investment team at the People's Pension that's been built up over the last year or so. That started with the appointment uh, of our first chief investment officer uh, in the latter part of 2017. That's Nico Aspinall. I suspect many people out there uh, watching today will know Nico. If you don't know him, Google him. Uh, he's got plenty of stuff out there. Uh, I thoroughly enjoy working with Nico because he's brought a real dynamism, a lot of passion, a lot of enthusiasm to the investment side of things. And most importantly, vision as well, uh, because he's <coughs> sitting with us saying, OK, we're already a big pension fund, £5 billion, but it won't be long before this is a £10 billion pension fund. And within a reasonable time frame, this is a £20 billion pension fund. Member pots will grow from the current average of what, 1,000, 1,300 pounds, much higher. It all gets a lot more significant, so we have to build for the future. And Nico's job is to do just that. Think about where we need to be, get all the building blocks in place, and adapt and evolve it over time. So he's been building his team internally to give him the firepower that he needs to bring to the investment committee. And a couple of key appointments over uh, recent months, Daniel Coombs joined. He's <coughs> Uh, spearheading our research into responsible investment, ESG issues, to make sure that these ever more flavour what we're doing, because it's obviously of critical importance. And David Sack joined us to head asset allocation and strategy. Uh, David attended last week's investment committee meeting, very impressive individual, got a lot of strong and clear thinking views that he's now bringing to the investment mix. So, so all of these people working together with the investment committee to drive forward the strategy in the future. Now, I think there are really four key things we're trying to do with investments at the moment. <coughs> Firstly, diversify. It's important that we diversify as much as we reasonably can, pragmatically, not racking up unnecessary costs, but doing it in a sensible way. We already mentioned that with Brexit, but regardless of Brexit, for the future of this scheme and for our members, we want them to be diversified across a wide range of different asset classes. The bigger the fund gets, the more we can do in that area and the more cost effectively we can do it. We're then looking to negotiate. We're looking to negotiate good terms with the suppliers to the schemes, with fund managers, with advisors to make sure that as much of the assets as possible in it being applied to members' costs and we keep uh, members' pots and we're keeping frictional costs tightly controlled. So we look to understand all of the costs in the scheme, then look to mitigate, control, negotiate them. We then move to a major control <laughs> phase, making sure that we're governing everything tightly, that the investment process is robust, that we make sure pricing is accurate and the scheme works well. Because at this scale, whilst we get great economies of scale, a scheme of this size, 80,000 employers, lots of cash flows going all over the place, you don't want to be making errors. So therefore, tight control is important and Nico's building within his team for that. And finally, enhance the flexibility of what we can do. So I said, we need these building blocks for the future. We need to enable ourselves so we can make changes. And a key change has been recently made here in that we've moved to a new custody structure with Northern Trust, which gives Nico and his team more control. And it enables us to seamlessly make changes and widen the opportunity set for the scheme without impacting on the member administration. And that will be critical for the next you reckon, Roy, five, ten years of this journey that we're on at the moment. Thank you, Steve. The, the questions are, are flooding in. Uh, firstly, a question from my old friend, Henry Tapper. Steve, what are you going to be saying in this year's trustee chair statement about responsible investment? A big question for younger people, in particular, younger people like Henry. Yeah, uh, I thought you'd have qualified that when you said old end Henry Tapper out <laughs> there, of course. <laughs> old friend Henry. Afternoon, Henry. Good to hear from you. The chair statement will be talking uh, a little bit about the journey on all of this. We have uh, an updated ESG policy, uh, which hopefully is available on the website. It's only available somewhere. So it will be. If not, it will, it, it will be, which we have been developing. And that is by no means the finished article, because as most of the people watching here will know, this is a massive bit of subject matter. Uh, and we're not looking just to make changes on paper for the sake of it to say we've done things. We want to be credibly looking at the data, looking at the evidence and <coughs> making concrete investment decisions that can acknowledge the risks and opportunities that flow through ESG. So uh, Nico and team are working on that. So Daniel is now uh, recruited to the team to focus on it. So that will be coming through. Sorry, Greg. I was just going to say, and is the, the, the 
I know we recently have changed custodian. Is that important in that regard, Steve? Because it gives us that the flexibility. You mentioned the ownership yeah. where we can make investment decisions um, reflecting our our view of the world rather than just having to accept the view of the world from a from an investment supplier? Yes, we're not just sort of buying things off the shelf now. We can start to structure things more to meet our own particular requirements. So absolutely, that's the, the first step on the way to doing this. So I think answering Henry's question, the, the chair statement this year is going <coughs> to be all about how we're enabling this, where our outline policies are, and where we're looking to go over the next few years. So work in progress. And in line with that, growth over time to what will be all other things we need quite a very significant pension fund. Roy, question for, for you coming in from, from our audience. Why should I recommend the People's Pension over another provider? How long have you got? <laughs> I, okay, I, no, I, I'm, I want I'm a comprehensive, convincing, but succinct answer. Okay, quite, quite, quite simply, um, first of all, in terms, I, I guess I would major on customer service, the first thing. Um, I don't know whether you've tried to ring some of our competitors. In fact, whether well, you can find the telephone numbers for some of our competitors. Uh, but uh, we major on customer service. Um, we will answer the telephone typically within 30 seconds. You will get through to somebody that will be able to answer your question. Um, or if they can't, they will make sure that they find someone that can relatively quickly. Uh, so customer service is number one. Uh, number two is we keep things simple and straightforward in our communication. So the way that we speak to all of our different audiences is tailored, but we make sure that it's, it, it resonates with them, that it, it, it takes account of what their position is in the market or what their position is in the scheme. Um, uh, so from an investment perspective, our investment returns have been very good. Um, the, uh, it, it's the usual things, basically. We have good represent representation out there. Um, we're a pretty diverse scheme. We do a lot of things actually that our competitors don't do. Sometimes we don't talk enough about it. But I guess the key thing for me is um, that we are a, a not-for-profit organization. Now that might not mean very much to a lot of people at the moment, but I think that that will be a key uh, differentiator in the future because we are entirely focused on members' interests. We don't have shareholders to, 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 to satisfy, so we can really focus on that and I think that premium will come to come to bear uh, over the course of the next few years. And we keep it simple. <coughs> Would that be part of it? Absolutely. My impression is, uh, keep it. You know, the, some sometimes simplicity is confused with simplistic approach. Uh, my observation is that people's pension keeps it simple, but not simplistic. Mm. And in a in an industry where complexity is seen as a proxy for sophistication, and they're not the same thing by any means. Mm. I think that simplicity has really struck me since I've joined in all our, in all our communications. But of course, advisors are you know faced with and get offered choices when they're thinking about provider to use. And there's another question that's come in, Roy. Again, I think probably you're the person to to ask about our mm. our pricing. People's pension, I'd say, is is a very competitive scheme. Charges all employers the same, whether small or large. Um, but questions come in and asking about. Um, are we intending to review, as we gain scale, um, our pricing structures? Absolutely. I mean, that's part of the uh, not-for-profit not ethos and the focus on membership. So it's one of the things that we can do. I mean, we're not going to change our principles here. So first of all, you know, uh, everybody within the scheme will operate to the same rate card uh, going forward. You know, we're not going to move to flexible pricing like uh, the traditional providers do. We're not going to cherry pick, you know, if you're working for one organisation in a particular job and you've got an identical person in an identical job in a different company, they will get the same price with us. We're, we're not going to play that game. It doesn't seem fair to me that because you work for a small company, you know, you get a worse price than somebody that works for a big company. It's just crazy. It's a lottery, isn't it? Yeah, so, so we will never change our principles in that respect. Um, as cash flows come through, naturally the trustees will, uh, will look at this uh, and I think it, it, well, Steve, I don't know what you want to say. Well, I, th I, think, I think it's fair to say that the trustees are continually challenging the business on this. <coughs> 
because we want to make sure for our, our assessment of value for members that we're getting the best value for members. And uh, there's a lot of reassurance in the fact that we are not for profits. It's not like there's a private equity company likely to spin us off in three years' time. This We are building for longevity here. We're building something that's going to be around for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. Um, but we have to be cognizant of good market value. So the challenge is there, and I'm sure that that will lead to revisions in how we do things at, at an appropriate time. And the People's Pension led the market, didn't it, in having that single pricing structure for all for all employers? Well, I think there are other master trusts and uh, other organisations out there that, that took that approach. Um, but certainly, as far as you know, our proposition is concerned, it's, it's very, very straightforward. Um, there's lots of moving parts beneath the surface, but um, as far as our customers are concerned, we hope that we make it as simple and straightforward and understandable as possible for them. Easy to use. That is critical in what, yeah. everything we do in the people's pension. So it's not simplistic. It is straightforward, though, and it's been structured in a way where it can be managed at this scale, and it's been managed very well. And I think one of the big successes in what we're doing is everything's integrated. All our administration is handled by the people's pension team. They're in Crawley. It's all in... No, a couple of buildings, big teams working together, working closely with the management. Anyone in that business can talk to anyone in that business on, on the shop floor, effectively, within minutes. And therefore, it's in, interconnected. We're not, we're not offshoring. We're not dealing with different organisations all around the place. And I think that's the strength, the team ethic. And David will probably comment on this, but when you go to the building, it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Part of my induction, um, I sat with the team's uh, employer face and, and um, member face, and then the employer face and team were fantastic. There was, there was a, uh, a customer who was having a problem uploading the file, and we were able to very quickly um, help them get mm -hmm. the files uploaded. And uh, the lady asked for feedback, and she got it. It's been fantastic. Great doing business with you. Very straightforward. And I've been very impressed with that since I joined. It's all can do, isn't it? it definitely. Right at this point, probably um, worth raising the issue of, which is a perennial issue of advisor charging. Mm -hmm. That's something that's come up in the past. Uh, an update on, continue to review that? Yeah, so um, it is definitely on our radar. Um, it is something that we do intend to do. Um, we want to fold it into offering uh, the pensions advice allowance as well. Um, I can't give any scales uh, or time scales on uh, delivery of that at the moment because um, it is quite complex for a, a trust-based scheme to introduce something like that from scratch. There's the um, there's a, a whole range of issues around uh, the way that master trusts have to operate through letters of authority, um, as well as the complexities of not having an agency system in place. So it's absolutely on our radar. I do expect us to introduce it at some point in the future. Thank you, Roy. David, we've discussed some of the, the biggest issues that affect any, mm -hmm. any pension scheme, whether contributions, investment, master trust authorisation, Brexit potentially, governance, of course. Uh, the, the issue which exploded onto the, the landscape in 2015 is pension freedoms. Yeah. Uh, how has the, the Board of Trustees responded to pension freedoms, mm -hmm. especially in the context of the reality that few of our members at this stage in, the, in a very immature scheme mm -hmm. in terms of its duration so far are likely to have significant pots at retirement mm -hmm. but with an eye in the future what yeah. are we trying to, to put in place for for our members well thanks greg that's quite a, quite a broad mm -hmm. question i'll i'll do i'll do my best um i, gu I guess i'd only tell this audience again that that um uh, dealing with uh, when, when somebody gets to retirement, it's very complicated, and we know that people uh, need some help. I think at the People's Pension, what, what we're trying to do is to let people know where they can go for guidance and advice. I think, I think the distinction you make between um, the small pots and big pots, the small pot is, is as important to the member with a <coughs> small pot as a big pot is. So um, we, whatever the size pot, we want to do our best by, by our members. But, but I guess the, there is a sort of an economic point here. You can get guidance for free. We point our members towards uh, pensions wise. We, we ask our employers and advisors to, to support us in that. And of course, advisors being advisors, if, if people do need something beyond that, or well they can offer support, you know, this, this audience is perfectly placed uh, to do that. I, in, in the event that, that um, there, is, there is still a need, we do have a sort of a digital uh, guidance and, a, and advice uh, on, online. 
uh, working with LV. But um, this audience, you know, I think we want to get to the place where, where no matter where a uh, member is in, in their retirement process, that they're getting access to the right advice. Thank you, David. I was seeing questions coming in, <coughs> continue to come in, and please keep them coming. Uh, excellent questions. There's many. I'll get through as many of them as I can. Uh, questions come in asking about uh, whether we envisage a change, and this would be a, a change at the government level, in the 8% total contribution levels, either an increase in percentage or a change to the qualifying earnings definition. I guess my response to that would be that it doesn't look likely at this stage that government is seeking to move beyond 8%, not least, of course, because that change hasn't taken place yet, even to get to 8% of qualifying earnings. And government, at the very least, will want to see how that change beds in, i.e. is there a significant increase in opt-out rates. But I think more widely, the tension potentially between increasing further contribution rates and wage rises, I think that's the context in which government uh, will examine this issue. I think if we saw year on year of sustained wage rises in real terms, then I think it would make more likely um, the, the possibility of quickly moving mm -hmm. beyond 8%. Do you think we're entering an awareness phase now, aren't we, where this has been launched, 8% is in, now it's getting people, members, to better understand what they've got and better understand what they might need for retirement? I think so, alongside the, the Master Trust authorisation process, because I wanted to pick up, I was really struck, Stephen, in your early comments, you mentioned David Chering uh, Risk Committee. Yeah. yeah. Uh, David, could you say a little about what the, the function of the Risk Committee? Yeah, it's quite, it's quite a broad remit. It's the Risk Administration and Communications um, Committee. So on the, on the risk side, we, we review with the business what, what the top risks are facing the business. You know, with, you know, it could be, for an example, would be we want to make sure uh, data is good between us and the employers. In, imperative to run our, our pension scheme as efficiently as we can. So we would look at the top five risks, we get presentations from the <coughs> business, and we make our own assessment based on the data that we're given to, to review. On the administration side, as, as Steve and Roy have said, there's a huge volume of transactional activity that goes through. It's our job, or my job as, as chairman, to make sure that the, the committee um, looks at all the important things like service levels, like contributions in out, invested on time, uh, employers that, that are, are late, are, are we following up enough? And again, if any of the advisors out there can help us in that, that would be brilliant. It looks at the, the splits of, of how the investment is, splits of membership, all sorts of things. And on the communication side, again, um, we're particularly concerned about uh, our communications with, with members to make sure that they're, they're absolutely fit, fit for what we needed to do. So my job and Sue Lewis, who's absolutely brilliant at this, we put ourselves in the position of as if, we, as if we are members and what would that mean to me and we were literally you know using the term the guys used we, we make it simple not simplistic but make it as clear as we can we've got a robust uh, approval process so that we sign off anything that we think uh, the member needs needs to see around scheme booklets and if if Roy and the team change the proposition so so we're, we're, we're very robust we were with uh, the, the business to make sure we, we get um, the right outcome so quite a broad church that the committee looks after. And this is the lifeblood of, of any automatic enrolment pension scheme, isn't it? Making sure that the the contributions are submitted and processed on time. I and mean, we've seen recently examples of of master trusts that haven't managed to do that mm -hmm. and have had um, you know fines from from yeah. the regulator on, on that basis. Uh, you know, how 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 is the people's pension managed to you know to so far uh, you know do that the hard yards of the administration of automatic enrolment for more than 80,000 employers, more than 4, mil 4 million members, mm. you know, efficiently? Yeah, I, I can speak from what, what I've seen. I joined in June, July time, and um, I think they've got good systems in place. They've got good people who really care about what they do. The attention to detail is, is fantastic. So, uh, so I think that's sort of the bed bedrock of it all. Um, I don't know, Steve, you've been around a bit longer than me. <laughs> yeah, it I goes back to that point I made about it all being run out of you know, the, the sites in, in Crawley. You know, it is a big team ethic and it can be well managed and issues, if uh, all administrative platforms are going to have issues, then get flagged up and dealt with very quickly. There's a good uh, culture of internal controls within the business. Yeah. Um, I think people are encouraged to be open about <coughs> issues and not <coughs> hide them. I think there'll be plenty of advisors out there watching today will know that history is littered. The history of pensions is littered with administrative things that have been hushed up or brushed under the carpet. No, that's not happening. Um, 
and just being aware of the sheer volume of employers that we've got there. That's why the online and the phone service is so good and important because we need to handhold people. If our customers, if those employers out there know that if they get in a pickle with something, they can phone somebody and they'll be got out of that pickle quite quickly, that improves the overall admin journey for everybody. So I think it's all of this together makes it a really sound system. So, Greg, can I? For a second. So, so right to, in, Dave. Thank yeah, you. so to be, to be clear on this, um, you know, we track trends. So when we send communications out, we look at response rates. We track the trends in, in money coming, coming in, coming out. Very good pipeline uh, process uh, to identify the sort of business flows that are coming in and the levels of communication that will be required for our, for our staff. So it's not, this is not luck, this is, this is by design. Very rigorous processes in place to ensure that we know broadly when there are going to be spikes in activity and so on and so forth. So the scheme has grown really significantly over the last 12 months, um, but we have scaled up and made sure that we've got sufficient people and processes in place uh, to deliver the same level of excellent customer service. Yeah, we learn lessons, don't we? Because certain things get identified. We might find two or three employers do something. So we know what the evidence is. We can then play that back and just find out if it's happening elsewhere and then stop it at an early stage. David? Yeah, no, actually, funnily enough, it was a similar point to, to Roy. I think whilst our job is not to be executive, that's for the guys to do it. It's our job to make sure that we, we are satisfied that, that they're putting in place processes that we'll deal with. I was going to use the example of we know what's coming along in April. There's already forward plan about how, how that's going to be dealt with. So it's my job as a trustee to be satisfied that the response is going to be is, is planned. So the, the, the People's Pension seeks to make for advisors and others an easy to use system, mm -hmm. a secure system. Yep. And on occasion when errors are made, they are, it's very easy to rectify them. Or if someone needs more information, it's very easy to get someone in the end of the phone or use the or the digital processes. Would that be a fair way to sum up the, uh, yeah, the if value? If you problem? find issues early in, in DC, <coughs> if you let things fester, it can cause enormous yeah. problems. And we've seen that in a, in a number of cases. If you get contributions wrong, I think mm. we were talking about earlier outside, yeah. contributions wrong, it's very hard to, to catch up when there's this big error because the contributions just keep yeah. coming in while you're trying to fix the previous um, problem. Time is moving on um, rapidly. I wanted to just ask David about pensions dashboard. Mm -hmm. My understanding is the people's pension have been involved yeah. um, very closely in the pensions dashboard policy area. David, uh, since where we are on, on that issue, for advisors' point of view, potentially pensions dashboard could make their life easier as they seek information about their clients. No, no, absolutely. I think we'll do a bit of double acts. I know you've been heavily involved with this, uh, Greg. But I, but I think, just coming back to the, to the straightforward and simple <coughs> thing, the, the People's Pension wanted to, to uh, answer for members the simple question, what have I got and where is it w mm. with regard to the pension pots? And so the idea of having a, a single dashboard where you've got, in a secure place, every pension you've got, wh what, the, what it's worth and who, who the contact is, sounds absolutely brilliant. And I think, coming back, back to your point, Greg, it's all about making sure that people can plan better for retirement and it's not just the preserve of the those who, who may have access through employment to uh, specialist advice. Who, it, it's to broaden the opportunity, I feel, for um, access to retirement planning because, you, you know, we, there's been umpteen studies, I think, People's Pension did one that, what was it, half, 47% admit they don't know how much they've saved for their retirement. So by bringing it all together, people will know and that'll give them an opportunity to get better better guidance and advice. Yeah, and I thank think you, David. You've been I, I think the, 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 the big issue that which pension dashboard as a single non-commercial dashboard needs to solve is the issue of what have I got and where is it? Because getting awareness mm -hmm. of POTS is the first step and then retirement planning comes down the line. And recently the People's Pension has commissioned the leading consumer champion, Dominic Lindley, to write a report setting out just exactly what the dashboard project group under the single financial guidance bodies ownership will have to do to deliver that that single dashboard where people can see what they've got and where it is and once we have that in place mm -hmm. then we can think um, more long term time is running away from us i just want to take one more question and um, which is for some clarification at retirement was mentioned earlier but there was no mention of how you deal with a member wanting advice is there a facilitated route to advice or is the member referred to the advisor community as a whole? 
Roy, very quickly. Right, so we don't have an agency system at the moment, but we do capture um, the advisor um, uh, uh, that's introduced the business to us. Sometimes the, uh, the advisor that's operating on behalf of the employer is the ad uh, advisor for the member, sometimes, that <coughs> sometimes they're not. So the approach that we take is, first of all, we refer them to Pensions Wise. The second thing is we actually ask them whether they've got an advisor. If they've got an advisor, clearly we hand off to them immediately. Um, if not, uh, and, we, and, and you know, having chatted to them, it seems that they do need advice, we will refer them to unbiased. Um, if um, they're uncomfortable with that, and we know that you know, I think it's somewhere between 10 and 18% of people take advice from, uh, from advisors, regulated advisors at retirement, then um, we point them at our, direct, uh, at, our, at our website. We do have the uh, LV digital advice process, which some people t pick up. So we're trying, but we will be developing that side of things. Thank you, Roy. So we're out of time. Time flies when you're having fun. At least we were having fun. I can't speak for the audience, but I would like to thank the audience for joining us today. Thank you particularly to those that submitted questions. Thank you to my August panel. There will be a recording available shortly of this session. And please do fill in the feedback forms. That just leaves me to say good afternoon. Goodbye.